And it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this afternoon's brown bag, which is going to be presented by Professor Siegel, who is a professor of anthropology at the Montclair State University. He has research interests in Caribbean archaeology and paleoecology. And he's currently um, at UWE in the Department of History and Archaeology as a Fulbright Scholar. And he has directed archaeological surveys and conducted major excavations on sites in various islands of the Caribbean and across much of Eastern North America. He's been funded by the US National Science Foundation, National Geographic Society, and the Wenner Grant Foundation, as well as the Heinz Foundation for Latin American Archaeology. So his work largely centers on island historical ecology and paleo environmental reconstruction. Today's talk is human environment relations and island colonization evidence from Caribbean paleoecology. And without giving too much away, um, in today's talk, we're going to be looking at what happened with some of the first settlers to the islands and um, how some of the challenge was with identifying um, the settlement archeologically. Um, he's going to throw in some things about volcanic activity, sea level rise and erosions from European land use practices and combine all of that with traditional archeological site discovery methods to address traces of these earliest peoples. But I'm not gonna say too much more. I'm going to leave all of that to Professor Siegel, who is going to be taking us through his presentation and we give him a warm welcome to now begin his presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Edwards, um, and for having me uh, come from a different faculty. Uh, just, right. So the, what I'm gonna talk about over about the next hour is uh, work that, I and colleagues have been uh, working on, not continuously, but on and off for about 35 years um, in the West Indies. And, um, and what I wanna do is, I'll get the advance button to work. Yeah, uh, I want to, uh, I, I start this discussion by, um, placing the Caribbean into the context of planetary human history going back. As you see, I, I like this uh, map made by Jared Diamond some years ago, showing the uh, migrations of humans over more or less the last 7 million years. Um, and, uh, and so you see the big uh, sort of sweeping arrows across the planet showing, at least based on 1999's data, it's matching, it's changed a bit since then, but it, it's, it's a nice map that uh, illustrates is sort of what I ref think of as globalization through human history. And so I have circled uh, the Caribbean uh, on that map. And uh, as far as the Western hemisphere goes, the, the West Indies was the last part of the uh, Western Hemisphere to be settled by humans. And then I always like to point out that it was also the first part of the uh, Western Hemisphere that was occupied by Europeans, as we all know. Um, and now I, no, oh, here it is. And then I also like to, uh, always in these kinds of uh, discussions and lectures, acknowledge the importance of uh, this professor, Irving Rouse. Uh, I, we think of him, at, at least archeologists in the Caribbean, most of us think of uh, Dr. Rouse as being the, the grandfather of uh, modern Caribbean archeology. span He had, and I'm guessing that some of you in the audience have heard of Rouse. In fact, I, I know I, I've talked to Villem at the SCR yesterday, and he re, he was referencing Rouse in that conversation. Um, 
And I'm going to start this discussion on Puerto Rico, where I did a lot of my early archaeology and, and paleo environmental stud studies, um, and focus specifically on this archaeological site uh, called the Maizabel site. Uh, so the upper right map of Puerto Rico, you can see Maizabel's on the north central coast. And this is uh, uh, a map of the archaeological site after, after uh, major uh, excavations that we conducted there uh, years ago. And we got the basic organization of the site. We had a cemetery surrounded by a, a handful of these, uh, what we call mounded uh, uh, middens. And then uh, what I want to focus on for this is uh, the pond, the, the large pond that you see at the bottom of the slide. And my down arrow doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so during our excavations of the site back in the mid 1980s, um, we, we had an explicit interest in understanding human environment relations based on the archeological uh, findings, you know, animal remains, plant remains, uh, primarily. And, um, and so here you just see two of the specialists on the team, Lee Newsom, who is a paleoethnobotanist, and then uh, Susan de France, who's a zooarchaeologist, were both part of the project and they came down and made what we refer to as what we call reference collections. So they go out, they make collections of the modern day plants and animals that are there. And then when they're doing their comparisons to the archeological remains of various plants and animals, it helps them to identify what species or genus or family these various creatures belong to. This is a, uh, an aerial photograph of the Maizabel site. You can see it's a coastal site, north coast. And then I want to focus now on, the, so north coast of Puerto Rico is characterized by, a, it's a limestone topography, a, a karst topography. And what you see circled in red there is a, a sinkhole, limestone sinkhole. And so here's that map again. And so if you look at the top where it says Myesbell Pond Coring Location, um, after some years after we completed our formal excavations in the site, um, I applied for funding and got a couple of grants to come back to do some coring in this pond, take some environmental cores, as well as from the nearby mangrove. Um, so here's a shot of the core or as, uh, of the pond as it looked in the mid 80s. And then this is showing us now out there. The photograph shows the uh, coring. We used a, a, what's called a, a vibra core uh, to uh, collect uh, uh, pond sediments. So the lower right uh, cross section, you see uh, that core uh, uh, taken in the, the floor of the sinkhole. It's extreme vertical exaggeration in this illustration to fit it in. Um, and we got some decent results, but I want to talk a bit about uh, David Burney is a well-known paleoecologist who's worked uh, in the tropics all around the world, but he's probably worked the most in Madagascar. But uh, three years before we did our coring work at Maizabel, uh, he, he and his colleagues published this article uh, from their coring a project in a lagoon only a handful of kilometers away from the Maizabel site. And, uh, and as you see from the title of his article, Holocene Charcoal Stratigraphy from this Laguna Tortuguero, Puerto Rico, and the Timing of Human Arrival on the Island. I think uh, Bernie's et al. study is, if not the first, one of the first uh, Paleo environmental studies conducted in the Caribbean where they explicitly wanted to see what, if any, uh, traces of human impacts they could find in their coring results. And, uh, and so I reproduced their uh, charcoal diagram and circled in red the radiocarbon date of 4,560 BP before present um, radiocarbon years. Uh, 
And in that study, um, they documented the presence of humans on Puerto Rico a good about 3,000 years before uh, any documented archaeological evidence of humans on the island. And what has very interesting in the years subsequent to Bernie's uh, et al's research, archaeologists have now confirmed that early date for human presence on Puerto Rico. And so I think his was one of the, it was probably the pioneering study in the Caribbean to demonstrate the utility of this kind of coring data to uh, get evidence of human activities. Um, yeah, I'd like to show this. Uh, this is a nice, it's, it's a really good article by Foley and others published in 2014, um, where they talked about the Anthropocene. Um, and as I annotated on their illustration, it's not yet formally ratified by the Commission on Stratigraphy or the Union of Geological Sciences, but it, it's commonly used as a, a term of, uh, as you see in the caption at the bottom of the slide, uh, uh, relating to the onset of significant human impacts to the planet's geology and ecosystems. And so the onset of the Anthropocene is thought of as uh, beginning with the Industrial Revolution with the great production of carbon emitting kind of industrial activities. Um, but what Foley and his colleagues wanted to recognize is this other era referred to as the Paleoanthropocene. And they're not proposing to make it a geological epic, but I think it, it, it's a useful way to think about prior to the Industrial Revolution, humans did have imp impacts on landscapes from the earliest hominids up through to, uh, well, till today. Um, This is one of the uh, maps uh, produced by Irving Rouse earlier in his career, and um, it's really antiquated with some of the terminology like subtaino. Uh, he himself uh, jettisoned that term at some point because it kind of almost has racist connotations. Um, but the, 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 the map is still useful to show the sort of the interconnected aspect of the, of the, of the Caribbean region since humans have uh, been in the region including today. And, uh, and what I put in a box there is showing the possible uh, direction of the original migrations of humans into the West Indies. And Rouse talked about the Yucatan, uh, Central America. Um, and there is decent evidence for that. And it still pretty much that is the evidence uh, based on uh, stone tool artifacts. Sometimes my down arrow works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, these are useful quotes to think about trying to identify some of these earliest human occupations in, especially in island settings. Um, and the uh, Collège and Connolly uh, in their paper, and they, I, they were talking about the Aegean region, but uh, it applies to any island setting. Uh, is that some of these earliest occupations archeologically are often invisible. Uh, and, uh, and this relates back to David Bernie's work. If archeologically they're invisible, sometimes they show up in the paleo environmental records though, in the sediment records. And then uh, Bailey, who's a major figure in the field of historical ecology, in one of his publications, it's a sort of an evocative uh, quote, that the landscape is a place of interaction with a temporal dimension and that past events have been inscribed, sometimes subtly on the land. So sometimes subtly is the operative term there for this uh, discussion. So, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, Rouse's uh, uh, point about the, the Yucatan as uh, the earliest entry of humans, but that, that, that earliest entry of humans on Rouse's map relates to the greater Antilles. Then you also have the, uh, the lesser Antilles and Trinidad. And really the oldest, uh, I accept this find, uh, uh, there's this spear point that you see photographed here. It's called the Beach Point because it was found in this town of Beach in um, 
Trinidad. And um, it was found on the surface of the ground by a child who uh, gave it to his teacher, who brought it to UWE St. Augustine History and Archaeology Department, where it's curated today. And uh, the thing about this uh, spear point, some archaeologists in the Caribbean have pointed to that as evidence of uh, what archaeologists refer to as Paleo-Indians, the earliest people in the Americas. And we have in North America, Central America, South America, very good evidence of Paleo-Indians. And this is a publication from some of the Colombian archaeologists where they had good archaeological context finds of these kinds of spear points. And you see from the title of their article, the initial human settlement West South America, the Pleistocene Holocene transition. Um, and so you see stylistically the uh, beach point from Trinidad looks similar. And, uh, you know, Trinidad was connected to South America, mainland South America, uh, before sea level rise in the post early post Pleistocene. Um, but personally, I, 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 unless it was found in an archaeological context, preferably by an archaeologist, and documented in situ, in the ground, uh, you know, I'd like to see better evidence of a Paleo-Indian occupation in the Caribbean. So in my opinion, we don't have it. But what we do have are these early well-documented sites in Trinidad, in southwestern Trinidad. And uh, this is from uh, Ari Boomert's uh, really wonderful publication on Trinidad archaeology. And so the uh, the uh, Banwari Trace site and the St. John's site, there, there's a complex of these sites that all date to more or less about seven, 8,000 years ago. And this is a photograph showing the, uh, the context of the Banwari site. And uh, as part of uh, my project uh, in Caribbean uh, historical ecology, I had a team. Uh, so on the left, you see Debbie Pearsall, who's a prominent paleoethnobotanist, Peter Harris, up to her right, uh, or to my right, um, uh, it, it was, a was a local archaeologist on Trinidad who actually excavated the uh, Banwari and made it famous. And then Jason Curtis is standing next to him. And Jason Curtis, if any of you know of David Hodel, who did some of the early pioneering paleoclimate work in like Lake Miragon, Haiti, Jason was part of Hodel's team. And he was also part of our team because we were hoping to get um, some paleoclimate data. For some reason my down arrow works and sometimes it doesn't. This is a photograph of Peter Harris's famous excavation unit in which at near the base of the unit, he got that, you know, he got a sample of charcoal which produced this data that you see on the slide which is now the oldest known radiocarbon dated uh, site in the West Indies. And from Boomert's uh, publication, he did, Boomer and Harris, Peter Harris, Boomer for some years was on the staff at UE, uh, UE St. Augustine, and uh, they worked closely together. And so uh, this is one of Boomer's illustrations of uh, some of the artifacts that came out of the, uh, the Banwari excavations. Uh, 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 grinding stones, uh, shell artifacts, bone artifacts. Now here's the, here's the question that you see on the slide. Did early groups avoid these islands in, in the uh, early to mid Holocene, all the way from Grenada to Guadalupe? Uh, there are a number of archeologists in the Caribbean who believe that there is no evidence of any of these early human occupations because uh, good archaeological sites for them haven't been found. And, you know, that's a reasonable reason to uh, uh, conclude that. Um, and so one of the uh, aspects of our project was we wanted to kind of investigate this a bit more uh, from the perspective of uh, paleoecology. And so some of the factors, and Dr. Edwards in the beginning when she introduced me, uh, she mentioned some of these uh, terms of volcanism, land use histories, and sea level changes. And I think uh, we need to really consider these uh, factors as uh, potentially hiding 
or erasing some of these early human occupations, at least the archaeological sites for them, and uh, especially sea level changes. If you have um, uh, many of the, we, we believe that many of these early uh, uh, colonizers were coastally oriented. And if these coasts, and then you see these reconstructed sea level shifts from 4,000 to 8,000 years ago, uh, uh, and MSL means uh, mean sea level. Uh, so so 8,000 years ago, sea level was about 13 meters lower in, than what it is uh, uh, today. That if you had sites on what back then were coastlines, they may now be underwater archeological sites and very difficult to find. This is an old uh, sea level curve uh, produced by Ramcharan. Uh, and, uh, but I use it just to kind of overlay on it, the human, what we know about human history in the West Indies as it relates to these, uh, this changing uh, sea level curve. This is a nice illustration by uh, Yago Cooper and Boothroyd um, for Cuba uh, illustrating this. So if you look at the, uh, the bottom map of Cuba where it's 5,000 years ago before present, you see the coastline is, uh, if you just do a compare and contrast between the two maps, you see that the coastline of Cuba uh, 5,000 years ago was quite a bit different than it is today. And the, the red dots uh, show the locations of documented archeological sites you know, on Cuba. So uh, if you look at the bottom map and you look, say you look at the South Coast, for example, uh, that portion, if you had archeological sites on that South Coast, and now you look up at the top map, uh, the, those sites would be underwater and not easy to find. So that could be a product of, you know, sort of like a sampling bias. So here's a map of the modern Caribbean. And, um, and what I have bolded, the island names, are the islands that we looked at in our project that produced what we think is evidence of early human occupations. So that's Trinidad, Grenada, Martinique, and Marie Gallant. So these are the challenges in identifying um, uh, human activities in paleo record, uh, in paleo environmental records. Um, so there's a term in ecology referred to as perturbation or, or disturbance, it's just a word in the English language actually. And, uh, and any event that uh, results in a disruption to an ecosystem, um, whether it's natural or human. Now the thing is, for you know, if we're interested in human impacts, we need to be able to distinguish natural from human uh, agents. Very good. Uh, one of these uh, agents is fire, and so um, uh, hu uh, ever since humans have been human, they've been uh, using fire, a and some more to a lesser degrees of it, depending on what they're doing. And uh, sometimes it's just clearing areas for building houses. Um, but in any case, uh, but you also have natural fires. We know that. I mean, you just, you look around, <laughs> you look around the world that we're, especially in Western North America now, where we have all these uh, fires with related to climate conditions. Uh, and as you have a, 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 a sort of an increasing light. So we know through climate history, there were, Periods of uh, climate, uh, periods of uh, planetary history where uh, the climate was uh, drier versus wetter, and in some of these very xeric or very dry kind of uh, climates, lightning strikes are more prone to result in massive fires, which can show up in these uh, kind of uh, uh, the sedimentological records. You also have uh, that next bullet down. Uh, you, you could have shifts in plant communities showing up. Uh, in the records. And then also what relates most more specifically now to humans is uh, if we have shifts in the values of some of these economically or ethnobotanically useful plant taxa. And, uh, and I'll explain in a minute the kinds of data that we use to talk about these things. And then uh, finally, uh, those elevated values of disturbance indicate, if we see a, a big uh, increase in some of these disturbance indicators, 
And some examples of disturbance indicators would be if, say, if you have people, for example, clearing a sizable area of vegetation for, say, a village, you're going to now have uh, much more sunlight coming into that cleared area because the forest canopy has been removed. And therefore, you have you start having like this influx of like weedy kinds of uh, plants, grasses, and such, uh, rather than uh, you know some of like the palm species. Um, and uh, and so below the red line there, the the bottom line is that uh, we we try to use what we call independent lines of evidence where we can integrate them and then come up with a picture of whether uh, what we're looking at in these uh, records is uh, 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 representative of uh, just sort of a natural setting uh, versus uh, a, a setting that has some imprint of human activities. So these are the lines of evidence uh, that we used to look at. We, we, we refer to the regional paleoclimate studies that have been done in the region. And uh, I don't know if Mike Byrne is here, but I, I've read some of his stuff uh, and you know he's done you know, some nice work in this regard. Um, and, but they're hiding these floating meetings. Um, so regional paleoclimate studies, we look at pollen uh, records, phytoliths, uh, uh, if you, I'm, I'm guessing most of you know what pollen is, but phytoliths you may not. So they're inorganic silica bodies that form in uh, the cell walls of uh, plants. And, uh, and just like with pollen, phytoliths, the sizes and shapes of them um, are indicative of the, uh, of the species of plant that produce them. So the sizes and shapes of pollen and phytoliths uh, indicate you know, you are, are, are uh, indicative of the, the species and genera of plants that produce them. So that's why they're useful in these kinds of studies. Then we also uh, look at charcoal particulates, you know, fire history, sediment chemistry, and then finally we need to be able to break, uh, you know, count, put this in time. So we have radiocarbon chronologies. If you don't have any way of dating these things, then they becomes an exercise in uh, relative dating, which is better than nothing, but it's not so great. Um, and then I always like to say that, you know, you know, this lecture is, I'm really focusing on the earliest human in, uh, incursions into the West Indies, but, you know, this, this sort of uh, environmental history is also useful for all periods of human history. And so when we get into the colonial uh, periods, we also have the uh, opportunity to look at their documents, you know, the writings of the early Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and later uh, recorders as to what were they observing in terms of uh, landscape conditions. So I'm just going to show a few slides uh, uh, showing you know, how it is we did this work. So the, the person you see up here taking soil samples is uh, Dr. Dunning, Nicholas Dunning, who's a, uh, a geoarchaeologist, geomorphologist. And uh, so he's taking soil samples to, as you see in the caption, to talk about what the sediment contribution was. In this case, we were looking at the Banwari Trace area. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, part of my proposal to NSF that got funded, but I said we were going to, based on all the satellite imagery and everything I had access to um, for Banwari Trace, we, our plan was looked to be like a good wetland in right near the archaeological site uh, that we would get a core to talk about the, the, the environmental record in connection with Banwari. When we got to Trinidad that year, uh, the, the local farmers in the area had uh, drained all the swamp, the, the wetlands uh, for farming. And so that put an end to that. We, you know, there was no point in taking a core there, but we did, we, we got a core from a nearby site called the St. John archeological site, which is more or less contemporaneous with Banwari. Um, and uh, so that photo on the left there, the, the, the woman on the left is Pat Farrell. She's also a, she was a student of Dunning's and 
she became a professor of what she calls herself a soils geographer. And uh, at the bottom on the island of Antigua, you see Nick. Done. So before we actually go to the effort of taking a core, we use a soil auger to check out the potential for there being like pollen preservation, phyolith preservation. And so you see Nick and uh, John to the left, he's the pollen specialist, you know, uh, checking out uh, on Antigua whether this would be a useful place to core or not. And then uh, we, on this project, uh, we used uh, what's called a modified Livingston uh, piston core that was developed um, by this, uh, I think his first name was Henry, Henry Wright at the uh, University of Minnesota some years ago. And, uh, and Jason Curtis, one in the middle, who was part of the Hodel team, he, uh, he built this uh, uh, coring device for us to use. And so uh, that's how we took our cores. And so here you see John, the pollen dude, and then me and somebody else standing there just staring at the ground. And um, so again, those are the four islands where we got what we think is, uh, our, we got useful data for the questions we were asking. And so here you see the core, it's basically just put a, use a lot of muscle. <laughs> and sometimes you have three or four people hanging on there to push it down in. And sometimes we're pounding it with a big like sledgehammer. But in any case, you can get cores if, unless you hit a rock, you can't go through a rock with these things. And so this is the St. John site, the one that we use as a fallback instead of the Bonwari trace. We got some decent core. Um, so each core, you can go each, what, we, what, we, what is called a drive, you can go down about um, a meter and fill up one of these tubes with a meter worth of sediment. Then you carefully, very carefully pull it out of the ground. And then you put a new clean one into that same hole very carefully. Uh, and then you continue going until you hit a rock and you can't go any further or you hit some kind of uh, what's called refusal, uh, like a dense sand deposit. And so you see at the bottom there, uh, four or five of these cores that are filled from one of these coring locations. All right, so to cut to the chase on radiocarbon dates, um, so you see along the left, the names of the places where we got cores that are relevant for this discussion. And what you see along the right side, uh, what I have in a much larger font are the bottom radiocarbon dates that we think relate to human activities. The ones in red, uh, where it says non-AP, that just means non-anthropogenic. We don't believe that there was any humans uh, presence, at least visible in those cores. So we did like, uh, we did get some, like the Lake Antoine date you see at the bottom, seven, almost 7,000, about 7,000 BC, that uh, 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 those were non-anthropogenic, no, no human activity. Um, but there, so if you look at the Trinidad date, about 53, 5,000 BC. And then you look at all the other older dates below it, Grenada, Martinique, and Marie Gallant. The oldest dates are about 3,000, maybe 3,500 BC. So there's a gap, you know, of a couple thousand years between Trinidad and the other islands. So these are the, the, the climate records. Um, and this is from one of Jason Curtis's publications where he was looking at comparing. So the Hodel team did, um, you know, and you see up on the map, the Google map, look, the, the, those uh, uh, thumbtacks are areas where they, they got some good cores. And so you see their climate reconstruction for these locations. So if you look at the very bottom of their graph where it says wetter to drier, basically, if you look Think points that are further to the left indicate a, a wetter climate versus uh, parts of the curve that are more to the right. And this relates to the oxygen isotope ratios, those values, uh, which they get from these carbonate. Uh, they were collecting these uh, creatures called ostracods, these uh, microfossils. Uh, 
Maybe that's how they do this. But um, yeah, this is just a picture of their lab, University of Florida. Hodel's no longer there. He, he got offered a job at Cambridge University, so he's off at, he's a Brit now. Um, uh, right, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about Grenada. And so you see on the map of Grenada, uh, the two locations where we got cores and Meadow Beach, which is near the coast, uh, uh, mangrove. Uh, uh, the, uh, what I did is I superimposed onto Jason's um, climate reconstruction, the bracketed dates that we got from the uh, Grenada core uh, of uh, about 3000 to 5000 be before present. Um, and, and you see on the, uh, the charcoal concentration value along the right side, a big uh, sort of elevated spike in charcoal. And this is during about the wettest period of uh, Holocene history. Uh, according to Curtis's uh, graph there. So we think it's counter to We think uh, that it, during the wettest part of uh, human history to have such a major uh, increase in uh, uh, fire history would be unusual. Um, this is from Lake Antoine, which is a, uh, a volcanic uh, lake, uh, crater lake on the um, on uh, Grenada, and you can see the little boat there. That's Jason and a couple of helpers going out to collect a couple of cores there. And so this uh, at the bottom is a pollen graph of uh, one of the cores from the lake. And um, and so the uh, the bulleted items, I, I just sort of highlight some of the results there. At about 600 centimeters, which I'm pointing to on with my cursory, which dates to about 5,600 BP. My eyes are pretty bad. I can't even read the date there, about that. Um, uh, is linked to a big increase in charcoal, uh, as well as other, uh, we had these uh, elevated values of pollen from these disturbance indicators. Remember earlier I talked about things that move are, are like colonizing plants into uh, newly opened areas. And so we had some elevated values of that. And um, what was really curious is that third bullet down, we had a uh, Ericaceae, which is this one. Uh, that's uh, the palm palms. And, and they're used, they're, they, people today in South America still use these. Palms. They're very. They're ethnobotanically useful plants, and you see almost a almost a, a an absence of it after where we believe humans arrived, and it was very perplexing. You know why 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 is there such a massive amount of it before the people, and then it drops out, and uh, and I I came across this paper. Uh, published not that long ago. And, uh, and, and I started thinking about it, the late Pleistocene plant exploitation and the importance of palm in the Colombian Amazon. And these uh, researchers, they, they, they're really, uh, they're talking about 12, 13,000 years ago in, in, in South America, but they found in their coring uh, that the, the palm uh, plant was really an important plant. And, you often think of these Paleo-Indians, or most archaeologists, at least in North America, think of Paleo-Indians as big game hunters. They're going after the, the mastodons, the mammoths. Um, to the contrary, these folks working in South America are saying, well, you got to look at what the Amazon consists of. And, uh, and so they're uh, saying, you know, these people were going after other things. And I, I was thinking that if you have some of the first people coming into uh, a small island in Grenada, bringing their Amazonian survival strategies with them, they could be exploiting palm on a massive scale in South America without having a, a major impact on the locals 
uh, palm species. But if they bring that same strategy to a, a very small island like in Grenada, they could almost put into extinction. It's just a speculation to perhaps account for the drastic decline, the dramatic decline in uh, palm, as we see over here. Uh, Cecropia, you see a massive increase. That's one of these uh, colonizing plants, disturbance indicators. Yeah. Anyway, so we finished up on Grenada. Uh, every night we had a very nice dinner with carob beers and then moved on to Martinique. Um, we did go to other islands in between, but I'm only talking about islands where we have any indication of some of the first colonizers. So on Martinique, we had uh, one of our cores, as you see down there on the sort of the southwestern part of the island. And, um, and again, I circled in red what uh, some of these indicators that we think are related to uh, human activities. And then yeah, this uh, illustration down, this graph here is from Phytolis. Basically, in this project, we had much better success with pollen than we did with Phytolis. Um, and I should also say that uh, one of the biggest, oh, right, very nice dinner on Martinique um, before going to Marie Ballon. Um, one of the biggest disappointments of this project, uh, the reason we had Jason Curtis on the team was we wanted to get some paleoclimate data for ourselves. And we were really hopeful that on that lake, uh, Lake Antoine, the crater lake on Grenada, where he got like a eight or nine meter long core, um, that he was going to get some good uh, carbonate preservation is what you need in order to get this ostracod, uh, in order to get the oxygen isotope. Uh, unfortunately, what he found was after breaking open the cores and going through them carefully, that the, uh, the ostracod distribution vertically was so discontinuous that he said it, it just wouldn't be possible. So essentially you need a, a ideally you have a continuous record of uh, the, this, uh, these carbonates from the top to the bottom from which you then generate these uh, isotope values to use for producing one of those paleoclimate records. So that was disappointing. Um, on Marie Gallant, we got a, also one of our second longest core after uh, Lake Antoine and uh, very, very tiny island, as you see. And uh, here's the pollen graph. Um, so the boxes in red are where we believe that uh, are where the first humans came in associated with that radiocarbon date of almost 5,000 years ago at 400 centimeters about. Um, and so you see at the right, massive increase in charcoal against during some part of the, during amongst the wettest part of Holocene history. Um, and then uh, you see these other uh, uh, boxes in red. What we really couldn't figure out is the two on the, the leftmost uh, bars, Combretaceae, which is a white mangrove, uh, and Rhizophora in the, uh, is red, uh, includes some other species, but red Rhizophora mangalae is the most common species of it. And, uh, you know, why did it flip like that? You know, I mean, was this caused by humans? Uh, I mean, we didn't know. Uh, in, in some of those bullets, I, you know, address some of that. And I think it's like the know, six bullet where it says rising sea level. It's possible that maybe uh, with rising sea level, the salinity levels of the mangrove swamp change such that um, red uh, no longer could live because red mangrove basically can only live in where it says 60 parts per thousand uh, uh, with the salinity uh, level versus a white mangrove that can exist in excess of 90 parts per thousand. So maybe it's related to sea level change. Uh, red mangrove has been documented in, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, the next bullet, a couple bullets down from that as uh, being a very good fuel wood. 
So it's possible that when the humans came in, they recognized that they got this red mangrove that was good for burning, making their fires. They exploited it to such a degree that it put it out of business. I, I don't know. I, uh, the problem with that idea is that it, it's, if you look at the decline in red mangrove just below the horizontal black line, it's actually a little bit before the increase in the big charcoal at the very right. So maybe it, it was on the decline anyways, perhaps related to uh, sea level change. So I, that's why I didn't put it in red boxes because I wasn't sure if really. And that was just before a nice dinner where we were drinking homemade rum from these people. Um, so these are some of the, the points with the timing of human colonization. We now think that uh, it, it's more or less in this range from 36 to about 3000 uh, BC, 3600 to 3000 BC, um, based on the charcoal values, pollen and phytolis. Uh, and we think that you know, so going back to that earlier slide where I said, did humans simply bypass all these islands? Because we do have early folks uh, up in the, like the US Virgin Islands. We have them down in Trinidad. So why would they, you know, just simply skip all these other islands, you know? I'm not them, so I can't say what they were thinking, but. So I, I compiled just some of the, uh, you know, some of the oldest dates that we know of, whether they're from archaeological deposits or anthropogenic landscapes through coring work on, the, uh, on, the, on these islands from Trinidad and then the Lesser Antilles, including, well, St. Croix, which is part of the Virgin Islands. And so you see, uh, if you just look at the right, the median, the, the right column, Trinidad again, 6000 BC. Uh, and then we have all those dates between three and 4,000 BC. And then St. Croix, it's the oldest date. It's actually from a core that we got there about 1,000 BC. Um, so Trinidad uh, geologically is part of South America. And you can see it clearly here with the formations. Uh, so in the early post Pleistocene, the sea level rise, it became an island. Now, the distance between Trinidad and Grenada is about 180 kilometers. All the other islands are much closer to each other. In, in many cases, you can see the next island. Uh, if you can't see it yourself, you can see the clouds hanging over it. And as I was talking to uh, Willem yesterday in the SCR, and he made a good point, and I think it's a valid point, that you can see where the birds are going. And uh, and so maybe folks in Trinidad could see the birds going up towards Grenada. Maybe, I, I, I'm not an ornithologist, I, but I should look into that. I should talk to an ornithologist who works in this part of the West Indies. And, uh, but maybe people didn't know that there were other islands up there 180 kilometers away. Um, but for some reason, so you see the dates on that illustration, 8,000 years ago, Trinidad, oldest possible dates for humans on Grenada, 5,600 years ago. So we're talking about a 2,500 year gap approximately. So, you know, we don't know why uh, there was this gap. I, 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 I've been speculating recently that perhaps it's related to some issues of demography, population densities, that uh, there is this notion of carrying capacity uh, in ecology. Uh, for different organisms, species. Um, and uh, perhaps, you know, there, is a, there was a nice study published recently uh, for mainland South America on paleo demography. And they are talking about uh, great population increases uh, right around 5,500 years ago in South America. So if the same phenomenon is happening here on Trinidad, which is right there next to it, uh, maybe they're hitting up on the carrying capacity for humans, given their level of uh, technology and exploiting the environment such that they decided to hit the road or hit the, hit the canoe and 
and go to other islands. And but maybe it took a good twenty five hundred years before that uh, phenomenon happened. Yeah, just another version of the map showing early dates for various islands. Yeah, this is a kind of a useful illustration from one of Sam Wilson's publications on Caribbean archeology, span uh, where he just showed the available radiocarbon dates at the time of his publication. But it kind of just shows, you know, this, if you look at, at from the right to the left, uh, where he has like the Guyanas and then Trinidad and then Tobago and, um, you know, the Lesser Antilles, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and uh, noticeably missing for this audience is, there is no uh, mention of Jamaica here, um, but you see the sort of the trend, and this relates back to that early slide of uh, Irving Rouse's, where he talked about um, uh, uh, early uh, 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 colonizers coming in from Yucatan, Central America, into the greater Antilles like Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, with those radiocarbon dates in the range of like four to five thousand BC. And then we know from the work of like uh, Harry Boomer, Peter Harris in Trinidad, and then others in the Lesser Antilles, we have old dates, in fact, older dates for Trinidad than we do Greater Antilles. Yeah, like I said earlier, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about this because it's not the place or time to do that, but, uh, uh, but this, you know, we did have uh, good results from this project in general from other islands, as well as the ones I talked about today, uh, about what this legacy of human history as inscribed in the landscape, third bullet down. And, uh, and, um, and uh, you know, and I've been working a lot with Zach Beyer over the year that I've been here about cultural heritage in regard to cultural heritage. And, uh, and we can talk about cultural heritage uh, as being expressed in many ways. And, and I would argue that we can talk about cultural heritage expressed in sediment records, and obviously in archeological sites. We can talk about it in the built environment, you know, structures of, you know, that we uh, relate to, memory, oral history, life ways. Cultural heritage shows up in pretty much all aspects of uh, human life. And finally, uh, to uh, kind of close this is the, uh, uh, the impacts, you know, talking about the Anthropocene and uh, talking about global climate change and talking about sea level rise, especially on small vulnerable islands. Um, we have this cultural heritage, which is really increasingly becoming threatened. And so here's one of the premier uh, solidoid sites. Solidoid is an early, what we call early ceramic age. Uh, uh, the first ceramic making peoples in the islands, uh, despite some opinions of other people. But in any case, uh, the Aklis archeological site on St. Croix is a very, very large solidoid site. Probably on the scale, it's probably about the same size as the White Marl archeological site uh, here in, in Jamaica. And, um, the uh, thing about Atlas is, and you see the, the guy standing here in the uniform, he, this archeological site is located on, the, is administered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and he's the ranger stationed there. And he was asking us, well, what, what can help, to, what, how can we mitigate the impacts of sea level rise on this very important archeological site? And we said, I don't know, <laughs> what, what do we know? We're just archaeologists, and uh, but uh, but what you see in the lower photograph is just pottery, human remains, shell, all sorts of stuff, just eroding out of the uh, this very important archaeological site into the ocean, and it's going to get worse and worse uh, with uh, you know as climate change increases, it keeps going. And I this is where I'm actually ending because we're sitting here in Jamaica. And here's one of the questions. So here's going back to Rouse's, you know, the entry of first humans into the greater Antilles, more or less based on current radiocarbon dates, about 6,500 years ago, more or less. And there is this underwater formation called the Nicaragua rise that I have shown here on the map. 
And about 6,000 years ago, when sea level was much lower, I think that the tips of this Nicaragua rise would have had, would have represented little islands, exposed islands, which are now underwater. So if you had people, we do have people living in Central America, and if you had like say fishermen going out to these little islands, if you look at the arrow, it's pointing pretty, it's pointing right to Jamaica. So, so why are, is there the, the oldest, archaeological evidence for any humans in Jamaica is only at the oldest about uh, five to 600 AD after Christ. Whereas Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico have good archaeological and paleoenvironmental evidence of humans dating back five, 6,000 BC. So why, are, why is there no evidence of humans here? And um, I, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, I, I guess you all know this Yoshi Mezumi who was here a few years ago. Uh, and I believe Yoshi and Mike Burns did some coring work. And I know other people years ago, like out at Wally Wash. Um, and they got old radiocarbon dates, but when I asked Yoshi once, I said, uh, did you find in your coring work, did you find any I mean, she's also an archaeologist, and I asked her, do you, you know, is there any evidence of human activities in your coring uh, data? And she said no. And so uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in either paleoecological work on the island or systematic archaeological surveys on the island, if there is some what we refer to as archaic occupations, archaic I'm not going to get into a big thing on terminology, but basically some of these earlier folks. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I just don't understand. I mean, did they just not like Jamaica? <laughs> What's not to like about Jamaica? But uh, so these are the, uh, the team members of that project. Uh, Debbie Pearsall, the ethnobotanist, Nick Dunning, eating his core. Pat Farrell, the soil geographer, Jason, Neil, Duncan. I didn't have a picture of Neil in the field, so <laughs> you're doing some ridiculous thing there. And, and then John Jones, the pollen dude. And this work, as well as some of the earlier work, was, was supported by all these various organizations, funding organizations, as well as my dean's office at one time. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, and I'd be happy to any questions. So thank you very much, Professor Siegel, for uh, I would say the ultimate geography geology seminar. In that we had climate, we had we had paleoclimate, we have climate change, so future climate. We had geology, we had a little bit of geomorphology. We had human occupation. Um, we had some disasters. We talked about fire. We had ecology. It just had a little bit of everything. And I, I think most persons here now would agree that there was something today for everybody. Um, and so it was a really great talk. Um, coming across from Life Sciences long ago, it, for me, it was the ethnobotany and the plant communities and the the families for the various trees when you looked at the economically useful plants that were coming out in the pollen records. So as I said, there was something for everybody. So now I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions or comments, just to raise your hand and we acknowledge and I will direct you to lead with your question or comment. Well, no questions. Uh, Not yet. I think everybody's still in digest mode. Um, oh, yes, there's one from Professor Robinson. Um, Professor Robinson, you can go ahead and ask your question. And after Professor Robinson, there's a second hand with Allenson Cruikshank. So Professor Robinson followed by Allenson Cruikshank. Prof. Rob, you have the floor. 
I think uh, yeah, R Mr. Robinson's uh, mute is on. Yeah. Well, okay. So while he sorts out his controls, I'm going to ask if um, Alan Cookshank can leave with his question in the interim. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pardon me for not um, turning my camera on, but um, you mentioned the, that there were quite early dates for Trinidad and, and to some extent, some of the more northerly islands um, in the chain. And uh, you, I'm, I'm wondering, because you mentioned that you were trying to figure out um, what would have been the reasons for them skipping some of the islands or yeah. You know, occupying some of them at earlier periods. But I'm thinking to myself, um, is it possible that um, there was probably some active volcanic, um, active, well, active volcanism at the time in some of these islands? Because most of these islands along that chain are volcanic. Right. And they have deterred them, at least from occupying them for any lengthy period of time. So yeah. um, I'm thinking that might be a possible hazard, I guess, hazard right. um, for a reason for that. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, I mean, as we see from like St. Vincent, Montserrat, you know, that goes on today, you know, vo volcanic activity was a serious uh, thing throughout uh, history. Um, and uh, we do have, um, in, in some of these archeological uh, projects, you, you have thick volcanic deposits part of, as part of the stratigraphic uh, layering and, uh, and uh, 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 I can't remember the island now that uh, Louis Allaire many years ago did a, a nice excavation on, um, I think it was Martinique on one of these early ceramic age sites. And he had layers of this volcanic uh, 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 tephra deposits. And, uh, but, but he had human occupations above and below them. And uh, I think people have been dealing with volcanoes uh, since they were, people were here in the islands um, and uh, come on and, you know um, I, I I don't think the volcanoes were a, a, an obstacle I mean obviously if you're coming up onto an island and there's a, vo a volcanic eruption happening at the time they'd be crazy to go land on the island and try to set up a, a, a shop there uh, and uh, 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 and then the fact that on, on the islands that I talked about where we did have data on this, uh, uh, you know, we, we think that, um, I think what, uh, but relating specifically to your question about volcan volcanism, I think that could be uh, 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 burying some of these sites under thick volcanic deposits that we can't find, you know, unless you happen to, do an excavation and you go through that volcanic, uh, uh, those volcanic layers uh, to identify them. But, uh, um, and, uh, but I think, um, you know, volcanism along with sea level uh, rise uh, kind of is obscuring some of the presence of some of these archeological sites, as well as uh, European land use history. We had a very good example of that on the island of Antigua, where we had a core. I didn't talk about that island because we didn't have any good data for early occupations, but we had a core about six meters in depth uh, and uh, with nice stratigraphy, including some volcanic uh, layering in there. And I was convinced that at the bottom of the six meter core, we would get a radiocarbon date of um, uh, something like whatever, 5,000 years ago. Well, our, we did get radiocarbon dates and our oldest radiocarbon date was like 1450 AD, like shortly before Columbus arrived. So at the bottom of six meters of sediments, we had a radiocarbon date of 1450 AD, and then a series of more younger dates all the way up through. And it turns out that uh, the reason for six meters of sedimentation was because the British, when they came and they set up the uh, plantation. Uh, there's a major plantation built in, I think, 1690 or so, uh, called Hope Estate at the headwaters of this uh, river. Through this massive amount of forest clearing, uh, they uh, uh, produced huge amount of downslope erosion, 
resulting in what we cored through. And so we documented a history of um, European human activities. Uh, 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 and so I think if we could have gone deeper in that core, but we didn't have the technology to go deeper than like six, nine meters, uh, uh, perhaps we would have gotten into more of the, the pre-colonial occupations. Uh, so this, so the land use, you know, the erosional history, the volcanic history, and the sea level rise, I think, are hiding lots of these archaeological sites. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Robinson. Do you want to unmute and ask your question now? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, no, my question was uh, precisely on that subject of volcanic activity. In fact, um, I, I might add that uh, there's been a lot of uh, coring offshore of the Lesser Antilles and a lot of dates on, on tephra deposits um, of different, you know, different ages going back 10,000 plus years. And so uh, each, each uh, volcanic eruption has its own signature and so you know where it's coming from. And I wondered if uh, a, a sort of re-evaluation of the offshore material could uh, perhaps point in the direction of which islands may have been unusually vol volcanic at the time we're looking at, 5,000, 3,000 years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that, those studies, so I'd have to look at and see what their actual dates are, you know. So you said it's through the, pretty much through the Holocene that they have like a tephra chronology through like yeah. the last 10,000 yeah. years. Oh, oh yes, and, and beyond, of course. I mean, right. some dates go much uh, further back. Yeah, into it. But there's a lot of, a lot of coring has been achieved in, in and around the islands and it's stuck in various papers in different journals so it yeah. would have to be a, a sort of mini research project probably right, right. yeah uh, well i you know like i said a minute ago i mean in some of our cores we did have uh, 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 you know um, volcanic uh, 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 I remember the term, the, uh, the tephra. Yeah, in there. And, mm. and we, when we had radiocarbon dates, you know, associated with them, and, and we could link them to at least ones that had been um, uh, documented historically in the historic era, like the, you know, the 17th century, 18th centuries. Uh, uh, I can't remember the names of them offhand. They're, we've published quite a bit on this stuff now. Uh, Soufrière, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember the names of these volcanic eruptions now, um, but um, and I don't remember if in our court we had if we had any volcanic uh, evidence of vol volcanism in our in our prehistoric uh, 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 sediments. <laughs> Um, there's been a brief interruption there on Professor Robinson said. <laughs> um, Prof Professor Robinson, I muted you while you stepped away. You have to unmute to respond. I, 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 have a, I have a diversion going on in my yard, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, oh. Yeah. Hello? Yes, are you finished now, Professor Robinson? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have somebody coming to the door at the time I was talking. Right. Okay, so, um, We've had the kind of a good seminar where we've had results presented. We've also had some unanswered questions which point to future work. 
we've had the sharing of information where some potential answers could be found. And so we have the best kind of resolution where um, we looked at things and we see where we're going or where there are ways to go forward with the work and potential collaboration. And of course, we've had the mention of researchers like um, Mike Byrne from our department, um, Yoshi Mizumi, who was here for two years, was it? Um, a year or two while Mike was off on sabbatical. And um, of course, um, our colleagues over in history and archaeology, Zach Weir, who was here this afternoon. And so it's just for me to say thank you to all of those persons who have joined us um, from various departments at UE, um, from overseas. We have our regular um, junior Prosper, Joseph Prosper, junior to those who know him well. Um, who joins us all the time, and to anybody else joining from overseas who was here sharing with us this afternoon. Um, please look out for other announcements of future seminars, and we look forward to sharing with you in the future. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon, and most of all, thank you, Professor Siegel, for such a rich presentation which brought out so many dimensions of the work represented in this department. Bye, everyone. Okay.